So, so why don't we get started? So this is the um, third episode of Grow Local for the Planet. Welcome. Thank you for all showing up tonight. Uh, there's so many things you can choose tonight. There seems to be a lot of, lot of activities. Um, so as, as we do more of this, um, for me, I, I'm getting to understand, it's getting a little clearer of what we're doing. And this process that we're going through right now, it reminds me of um, years ago when I, uh, in my more bohemian life, um, used to go and join a handful of people in these uh, low rent district lofts and um, storage spaces and, and, and places like that. And um, these unknown artists would perform, these dancers and poets and storytellers and musicians. And, and it was just really intimate setting and, uh, and, and uh, supporting these people who were expressing the, the passions in their lives. I feel like that's what we're doing here. Um, uh, we're just gathering a bunch of Winchester residents who um, have all this experience in, and knowledge in different areas. And we're all very concerned about what's going on to our planet. And um, we're just bringing all these experiences together and, and, and putting together and, and, and trying to um, find ways to make things better. And I th the perspective that we're coming up with is that we are trying to change our relationship with the planet that um, the way we've been going has been uh, uh, you know it's like we're that we have the attitude like we own the place that we're exploiting the place that we're enablers for the for, for the way we're doing things. And we're trying to change that re relationship more to be cohabitors of the planet. And so maybe we can use the language of, of relationships and of um, social justice to help us along with this process. And so um, we're using Linda Forsythe's yard as a, a laboratory or as a, a, a therapy room to um, explore what it means to change that, this type of relationship, explore to use the, the terminology, our biases towards the planet. And so, um, the process that we've been using has been part of the change. We've been, it's been a really fun learning experience. And we keep bringing to, to our room all the new things that we're learning and how that applies. And so now all we're just doing is extending the room. We're making the room bigger uh, to get more people in on the conversation. So um, why don't we get started what we've um, got ready for this week. Uh, Demetra, who was with us last week, couldn't make it tonight. So we got Margot to film her on camera. And so why don't we start with uh, Margot introducing the, the film clip. We filmed on a very cold morning. I think it was 25 degrees or something. And uh, Shu Kong was there to help, help film it. 
And um, let me. Welcome to my yard. This is the back 60. It's a, a yard of about 60 by 60 feet. We've been here about 20 years. We raised kids in this yard. They've played, they've had fun. We've had a little bit of a garden, not much, and uh, we're ready to do the right thing. Um, I first thought I wanted to just have it all garden. I uh, got invited by a couple of friends to get together this thing we're calling Grow Local for the Planet. And all of my visions have changed with some wonderful input from friends. And my vision is now uh, something I feel really, really good about. And we're gonna be taking this back to uh, nature and harmony and uh, mindful of migration and birds paths and mindful of native trees and mindful of uh, other kinds of um, diversity. Hi, uh, my name is Demetra Tsekras and I am Gardens by Demetra, which basically means I design and install beautiful gardens for outdoor living in Winchester and Arlington and all around. And I've been doing this for 15, 16 years, but I grew up gardening because my mom is a fantastic gardener. So I've really been gardening my whole life. Um, I am gonna be talking about two big, big items today. First, we're gonna talk about invasives and how to get rid of them. And that's all about natives and non-natives and good plants and bad plants, which is very judgy, but we're gonna to have to deal with that. And then the second thing we're gonna talk about is what is appropriate to do right now in your garden? Because we're all dying to get out there, especially after last week when it warmed up, it's gonna warm up again. And I'm gonna give you some pretty strong advice about what not to do, but also what you can do. So we'll get started. The first plant we're gonna look at is this, what I call a pricker bush, which is a barberry. And many of you know them, They're, they've been planted as hedges to keep kids out of yards for decades and decades. They're a plant that you will know because if you ever touch it without realizing you're going to get really hurt because the thorn is quite remarkable. And they, some of them have red leaves and some have green and they all make little berries and which the birds do eat and then they distribute widely. It's not native, meaning it didn't grow up here in this part of New England. It doesn't offer a good, good source of food for birds and it doesn't offer anything for bugs. It's illegal to sell them at nurseries in New England. Um, they're that bad. So this is a plant, if you have it, that should really come out of the ground. If you really like it and you want to keep it, that's understandable, but what you might want to ask yourself is, if I took this out, what could I plant instead that would make sense, not only for sort of the size and the shape of the garden that you're, that you're working with, but also for what kind of creatures are you trying to attract to your garden, which I hope you're attracting songbirds and the like. This plant could come out, and because this is pretty much full sun, you could plant almost anything here. And you could plant a, a native hypericum, which would have beautiful yellow flowers and then gorgeous red berries. You could plant anything. Uh, you could plant blueberries if you wanted right here. So you'll understand it's very hard to kill. I like to wrap a big piece of burlap around it, tie it up nice and tight so I don't get hurt. I always wear long sleeves. And then I take a sawzall, which is a, a tool you can use, you can get a blade that can handle going into dirt, and I just get at the roots as best I can, and I get it out. If it's a new plant, you can dig it out, of course. And then you don't give it to a friend, you don't send it down the street to a neighbor, you dispose of it properly. It can be composted, get rid of it. Very bad plant. Now we're going to move on. Uh, so here we are at the second plant I want to introduce you to today. Most of you know it. It's called burning bush. It's a kind of euonymus. It's a beautiful plant four or five days of the year when it turns bright red. Otherwise, it's just sort of a big green mound. It's very invasive. It's, Ill it's illegal to buy and sell it. And it's become a scourge in areas where um, it has infested woods. 
and taken over. And what it is very good at doing is nudging out native plants that we really need in order to feed our songbirds. So even though birds do distribute these seeds, they do eat the berries, it is not a good source of nutrition for them. So if you remove it from your landscape, you're ultimately doing the right thing, not the wrong thing for the birds. So burning bush, you can tell it's got sort of a, a stripy look to it. Um, and like I said, it turns bright red. Underneath, you'll see the soil if you really get in there when you're removing it, which I hope you will all do. You'll see that the soil is really dry and it almost feels dead. That's because it is. It really does a number on the soil. It takes a lot of moisture into it. To remove it is pretty straightforward, although the roots, if it's an older plant, the roots go deep. So you need a sawzall. You just cut it and then you get in there and you just dig out as many of the roots as you can. It is a persistent plant. You, if you don't get all of the root, it will come back and you just have to keep after it until you've killed it. And this yard is particularly infested with another really hateful invasive plant. If you look up into this sort of looming arborvitae hedge, you will see a big fat robin, who's very cute, but you'll also see a tangle of sticks. And if you look closely, you'll see a lot of red berries. These berries are particularly beautiful in the fall. A lot of people love to take them and decorate their houses with them, which is illegal. That's Asian bittersweet. It's, um, it was introduced a long time ago because it was a pretty vine. And what it does is it grows extremely quickly. Birds do eat the berries, but generally not because it doesn't have um, it doesn't have the right fat content or the sugar content that berries that birds need, our songbirds need when these are ripe. So that's why you see so many of them still persisting on the vine, and you see so many of them on the ground, which is of course future plants. These vines are particularly bad because they can grow up a full, a full grown real tree, like an oak tree, and get up into the canopy. When it covers the canopy of a tree, it will kill it within two years because it denies it the sunlight that it needs to live. People think, oh, but they're pretty. Well, they're really not pretty because they really do kill very important plants like trees and shrubs. So getting rid of them is number one priority to do, and now is a really good time to do it. Although you'll never get rid of them in the first go. Your main goal is of course to cut the vine so that anything above where you cut will die. But anything below that's still in the ground, you have to get out of the ground. Meanwhile, the stuff that's looming up above your head you can very carefully yank some of it down, but if your trees are compromised, and these are because these are very mature vines that have been wreaking havoc in this yard for many, many years, I wouldn't pull because I don't want to get killed by something falling on my head. So you do really have to be careful. In time, if you are persistent, you can get rid of the bittersweet. Now I want to talk about American bittersweet. There is a native bittersweet. It is also very pretty. But do not think that it's a good plant to put in your yard because what's happening is they're hybridizing. So the Asian and the American bittersweet are creating a new form and they just do such damage. So protect your trees and your shrubs and get rid of this hateful vine. Okay, so the next plant we're gonna talk about that you might have in your yard or that you've probably, if you have a down yonder, it's probably down there, is this wild rose. And it is not a precious rose that can be, you know, maintained. It's a wild brambly rose that's highly invasive. You'll know it this time of year, it's got those bright green sticks and it's very prickly and it's a real bramble you will undoubtedly have rabbits living under it, birds living in it, and you think, but it's good for them. Well, except that it will kill anything that's 
near it, underneath it, next to it, because it will smother it. And uh, it's not doing, it's, it is offering a place for those creatures to live, but other plants that are native can do the same thing and offer more as well. So that's a plant that needs to go. Uh, again, long sleeves and wrap it tight, rope it up and dig it out as best you can. It's very persistent. You're going to be chasing that one for a while also. It's another plant. If you can't dig out the root, you might want to just paint the root with Roundup to kill it so that you can move on. Uh, so I talked before about Roundup um, and there's a lot of different kinds of Roundup. Some of it is to kill grass. Um, don't use Roundup to kill grass. Roundup is being used by home gardeners more than our farmers are using it in their fields now. Roundup is an herbicide, it kills plants. It'll also kill you. It'll, you know, I mean, it, that's just true. So don't use it unless you really need to. And when you do, use it as, as surgically as possible. I could come out here in the spring when all this vine is pushing green and I could just spray it all over the place and that would kill the plant. But it would also kill every other plant it touches. So there's no reason to do that. You just work a little smarter with it. But if you do choose to use it, um, that's, you know, that's how. I literally screw the top off, put a paintbrush in and I paint stumps. Or, and you never use it on a windy day, right? It's common sense. Use it on a still day and use it as carefully as you can. And then, you know, if, you're, if you do not ever want to use it, you don't have to. Just keep denying the plant sunlight, just keep denying it, and eventually you'll kill it. Now, I also want to talk about um, this time of year. People are itching to get out into their garden and do a spring cleanup. We use that term, we use it in the fall. Fall cleanup and spring cleanup. And it usually involves very loud blowers, armies of people showing up, taking away every single leaf that has managed to stay on the property over the winter. It is absolutely important not to do anything like that this time of year. Underneath the leaves are overwintering bugs and the bugs are good. And the bugs become butterflies and they become damselflies and little tiny pollinator wasps and good pollinator bees are native bugs. Songbirds our native songbirds rely on those bugs to feed their babies. They don't feed them seeds, it's not baby food. So if you take away all those leaves in the fall, and then certainly if you take the rest of them away now, you take away an entire generation of good bugs. And that really shows. It shows in our landscapes not uh, being as abundant, not fruiting as much, we need those pollinators, we need those bugs, and we need the songbirds. So I beg you not to get out there with blowers, not even with, with rakes yet. It's best to get rid of your invasives this time of year. You can do your winter pruning, it's time to prune a grapevine, it's time to cut back your raspberries, your fruit trees, etc. But wait until it's warmed up, it should be 50 degrees every day for a week, and then if you can possibly bear it, wait one week more. And then get out there gently with rakes. Otherwise, if you're blowing, you're blowing like little baby toads out. Don't do that. Just rake as best you can. And then compost the leaves. But remember that leaves are mulch. It costs you zero dollars to get that mulch. And if you leave as many of them as you can in a shrub and tree hedgerow, for instance, it will, they'll break down and they'll feed the soil which means you don't have to worry quite so much about the health of your plants. So um, you'll hear that a lot from me. If you're part of this group, you'll hear about fall cleanups and spring cleanups. Um, it's really good to be a lazy gardener. Enjoy it. That was great. That was great. Thank you much to all who were involved in that. Um, and thank you, Demetra, uh, for your expertise on recognizing and dealing with invasives, um, including the safest ways to use glyphosate. I love the word surgically. 
uh, for those who choose to use it. I'm Linda Forsyth. For those who don't know me, um, I am a psychiatrist, very interested in the health of the planet as well as the people on it and every other living thing. Um, our next segment, and I, oh, it's also my yard. Um, our next segment will go into more detail about the many dangers of glyphosate so that your decisions can be informed ones. So in transition, I wanna say that glyphosate is everywhere. Since 1974, 1 1.6 billion kilograms have been used on crops in the US alone. It's a water soluble toxin, which is important. Most of the toxins that we have to deal with are fat soluble and they get to store in our fat cells. Of course, it includes our brain and our bones, but it keeps them away from our circulation. And this one is water soluble. It's in the food, 70% of our agriculture crop, crop, uh, crops, including your Cheerios and your Wheaties, including your chicken nuggets and your daily bread, beware. Um, it's in the water, it's in the rain, it's in the rivers, it's everywhere. Glyphosate is also an antibiotic. That's how it was first uh, um, patent, but it's an antibiotic of the earth. It turns our living soil into mere dirt, killing organic matter, leading to the loss of soil carbon, putting more CO2 in the atmosphere. The crops may look right, but they're devoid of their microbiome and the associated nutrients that are required for healthy function of human tissues. The last thing I'll say before we go to the next segment is glyphosate is harmful to humans, contrary to what the company wants you to believe. About 14,000 lawsuits are pending against glyphosate. It destroys the human gut microbiome. microbiome. It destroys the integrity of the gut lining, leading to something called increased intestinal, intestinal permeability, also known as leaky gut. And there are early signs servicing that it directly interferes with the mitochondrial function our mitochondria are ancient uh, bacteria engulfed by our cells, our cells. So this is big stuff. Our next presenter will go into a little bit more of the detail. And um, I offer you Sarah Diamond. Hello, um, I'm Sarah Diamond. Um, I'm a nutritionist um, and I'm the founder of Finding Ground Functional Nutrition. So I work with um, people on their health um, and I have a presentation about glyphosate for you and how it directs, directly relates to human health. Okay. Can everybody see that? My, yes? Okay. All right, so glyphosate and gut health. Um, so yeah, as I said, I'm Sarah Diamond um, and I'm a nutritionist. So glyphosate is the active ingredient in um, Roundup, which is a company or which is made by the company Monsanto. Um, so in 1996, there were about 15 million pounds of this circulating in our environment. And by 2019, there are there was 287 million pounds. Um, and these are some of the top crops that are treated with glyphosate. So they're really, it's, that's, you know, the majority of the American diet right there. Um, so one really interesting piece of research that's emerging is the connection between celiac disease and gluten intolerance um, and the increased use of glyphosate. So basically glyphosate completely eradicates um, the beneficial bacteria that live in your gut. Um, one of them is lactobacillus and it's, it's supposed to be able to um, help break down gluten as well as casein from dairy. Um, and these are big proteins and they're very difficult to digest. So we need um, those beneficial bacteria to help us. So glyphosate kind of impairs that. So this is um, just to give you an idea, there's a really, really strong direct correlation between the increase in celiac um, disease, which is an autoimmune disorder, um, and the use of glyphosate. So you can really, since the you know beginning of the 1990s to now, it's just really, really shot up. Um, this is some more detail about what's going on in the gut. Um, and it's, it also causes something called leaky gut, um, which is kind of how celiac works. This, the gluten molecules are able to pass through the gut and get into the bloodstream. And that's what causes the immune response. Um, and, um, yeah, so it's a really, really horrible thing that then leads to more, um, disease later on down the road. 
So it's also connected to autism. Um, so autism spectrum disorder has increased dramatically since the 1980s. Um, it was at one in 5,000 children in 1975 um, and is now at one in 36 and that's just growing exponentially. Um, and there's a lot of strong studies that suggest that glyphosate um, exposure during pregnancy can increase this risk. So this is another really interesting connection. Um, it, Protein synthesis is a lot of what happens in the gut. Um, and 25% of protein is uh, collagen, like what makes up yours, a lot of your skin and bones and joints. Um, so basically glyphosate disrupts um, our collagen molecules by substituting for glycine, um, which is what's supposed to be there and instead replaces it with the glyphosate. Um, and this is a lot of why we have really high incidences of like knee and hip replacements, um, joint pain, all of that kind of stuff. Um, and then glyphosate is also really linked to things like anxiety, depression, which are gut related issues, um, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, which is a type of cancer, um, and then really just so much. And the, the research is still kind of emerging on all of this stuff. Um, and as um, we've mentioned, there's a lot of active lawsuits currently happening. So this was in 1992. Um, just to give you an idea. And by 2016, it is just everywhere. Um, and of course it's mostly located in the, um, bread belt of the country, the corn belt, the Midwest, where we grow the majority of our crops and the Mississippi river flows right through that, um, the bread belt, the Midwest, and that last 90 miles of the Mississippi river, mostly in Louisiana, um, has actually now, been called Cancer Alley and um, all of the roundup that has been collected along the way kind of congregates there. And a lot of people are suffering from their fourth and fifth cancers because it's literally in the, in the water that they're drinking. Um, and yeah, it's a, it's an environmental racism issue. It's, um, it's just really horrible. So there's not, it, as, as mentioned, it's everywhere, it's water soluble, so it's very hard to get rid of it. Um, and even if we were to stop completely, like if we banned it today, it would still exist in our environment for at least another 50 years. Um, but there's a lot that we can do um, to protect ourselves and our communities. And a lot of that has to do with regenerative agriculture and growing your own food um, and just kind of, you know, essentially like starving out. Um, these, these companies that insist on using it and um, hurting the planet and people. Um, and that is it, thank you so much. Thanks, Sarah. That was a great presentation. Um, now, Prasada, do you want to do a, a, a quick, connection between um, invasives and, and um, ecosystem restorations. Yes, okay, that is of course not the first slide. Let me get to the first slide. So thank you for being here, everybody. Um, Fred talked about our learning path in this week or the past few weeks and I had such an aha this evening sort of putting things together that I was practically giddy. Um, so it's part of what I want to share with you. So we've, we've talked about, we've, we, we keep telling you about natives and the, why native. And it occurred to me that really what natives are are things in the wrong place. And I promised you that we would try not just to tell you things that you could Google, but we would try to connect the dots for you. So today's meta is about things being in the wrong place because we are talking about that at levels from non-native plants. Demetra pointed out bittersweet, also non-native animals though we're not focusing on those specifically. Uh, Fred will and Carol will talk about mycorrhizae. Linda and Sarah just talked about glyphosate. These are all things that are not where they belong and glyphosate messes up your metabolism because it mimics, it has some things that look like glycine. So it fits into glycine receptors, but it isn't actually glycine. So the receptor doesn't get completely filled and the rest of the metabolic steps don't happen. 
which is pretty much what happens when you have invasive species in an area. So I wanted to follow this line of reasoning. Let's talk about what is native. So a native species is one that naturally grows here. And the time frame we're talking about is ecological time frame, more preferably evolutionary time frame. Here being a place that's defined by latitude, altitude, wherever you are geographically. And an invasive species by contrast is one that doesn't naturally occur there. So because it doesn't occur there, just like the glyphosate molecule doesn't really fit into the receptor, it disrupts what would normally happen in the ecosystem. It outcompetes other plants. It's better at getting soil. Its roots go more quickly so that it is disruptive in this very specific way. People also use the phrase invasive for a native plant that will grow very quickly and disrupt, but it's technically just referring to species that aren't naturally occurring in this place. You'll find people use it both ways and it's worth remembering that it is used both ways. And then there's a third category, which are naturalized species. And those are non-native species that might or might not be invasive and that don't need human help. So some of our favorite garden plants are naturalized species and they don't occur here. They're not particularly invasive. They don't give much into the ecosystem, sort of the Barbary that Demetra was talking about. It's not terribly invasive. It's not gonna colonize all of the Southeast if we leave it alone, but it also doesn't give much because it fits itself into the habitat, but it doesn't have the same features of plants that belong in this habitat. Two minutes. Thank you. So remember I talked about the three jobs that all living organisms have to do. And a habitat is the best match between an organism and its place. It's where it can do those three jobs. It can get food, it can avoid predators and not become food, it gets protection, it might migrate through, it might get food only at some times of the year. And of course, the most important thing is it makes and has babies and raises those babies. So we have these different pieces and we're trying to put them together in a way that makes sense of things belonging and not belonging. Now, ecosystem function is something people talk about a lot. You know, the, oh, the air gets cleaned by the plants and the water is filtered through the soil and things like that. Abiotic has two components. It has the physical chemical components, the water, the light, chemicals, minerals, weather. And the biotic is all the organisms, everything, anything you can think of that's living. And these things work very well in an integrated way. They have evolved together over time, pretty much. And the real issue is that non-natives disrupt habitat and they disrupt ecosystem function. They displace native species, whether that's in your gut or whether that's any other poison you take in or whether it's a species like the starling, which has driven many native species out of the Southeastern United States. So I'll give you a specific example and we'll talk about what the disruption issues look like. I showed you this monarch butterfly migration map. So look at this map. This is really all up and down the Southeast coast and into the middle of the country. This is a map of the US Forestry Service has forest plots all across the country, which they use to keep track of what's happening out there in the natural world. 39% of the forest plots of over 700 million forest plots have one or more invasive species in them. Here are, here's the distribution of those. And you can see that there's an awful lot of them here. And you see that this is where the monarch butterfly and the birds and a lot of other things that we've talked about actually migrate, not just live, but migrate. So, and this is, and look at Hawaii, that's 70% of the forest plots there have one or more invasive species. The Western forests, it's less, it's more on the order of six to 10%, but here in particular, it makes 
an enormous difference to ecosystem function and to the species there. So what are we doing? We're talking about reversing this and planting non-native, non-invasive species here so that we can try to reestablish the natural equilibrium among all these parts of this functioning system. So there are a couple of things that I won't touch on, but that we will talk about in the future. What about naturalized species? You know, this is like when you talk about your carbon emission, you, talk, you have grandmother air miles, air miles are so toxic to the environment, but nobody's gonna give up visiting grandma at Christmas or Thanksgiving or whatever. There's some plants, you know, there's the peonies that you love, or in fact, uh, Demetra talked about the, the uh, wild roses. I keep them because they do give some habitat function. The rose hips freeze very early in the winter and they're edible by birds, but you have to have a lot of space and you try to keep them from spreading. The rule that I like to go by is, can you get three quarters of the plants in your garden to be native, three quarters by biomass? And things we can talk about in the future are trade-offs between a non-native lawn and say non-native woody plants. And where does lawn fit into this? Because lawn is itself an altogether peculiar and unnatural thing the way we do it here. So I wanna leave you with this because it's a gorgeous picture and ask you, where do you think, would this be camouflaged if it were here in New England? How many rose colored things do we have here in New England? Not very many. This is an orchid mantid. It mimics orchid blossoms so that it can hide from predators on an orchid blossom. Clearly, if you drop this into another place, it's not gonna do very well and cause it's gonna stick out like a sore thumb. So keeping natives where they belong and returning them where they have been taken away I hope that's something that you'll focus on and we can all do that together with more Grow Local. And that's it. Wonderful. Thanks, Crusader. You're welcome. Uh, let's see, Carol, you're back. Would you like to um, do your presentation? Sure. Let's see. Good old share. Okay, just a moment. So mine's on uh, soil and water. And a key thing in regards to a healthy soil <clears throat> versus chemical soil is what's called the soil sponge. And you have a soil sponge when you raise the organic matter up high enough in your soil. And it's from a number of different things, but it includes having uh, perennials versus too often agriculture has annuals. So there's huge difference in what's building down here, but we've already uh, discussed the uh, huge um, micro, microbiome uh, features uh, but the key, so the key thing here is what is the soil sponge? The soil sponge or the soil carbon sponge is a living matrix that soaks up stores and filters water, holds landscapes in place, and provides nutrients for an entire food chain from what would otherwise be bare rock, hardened clay, and desert sands. And although the soil sponge is now um, severely damaged uh, across much of the globe, it remains ready and willing to spring back into action as soon as we allow it. And there's been incredible examples of being able to restore the earth. And as mentioned, there, it's very exciting that the Earth Day, uh, the theme is restore our earth and the UN has seen such incredible examples that they now call this decade um, ecosystem restoration. <clears throat> So uh, this is one for from uh, Kiss the Ground that basically points out, and this is a really important thing that they emphasize is the word net. So net means that through the cycle, through a healthy soil, 
you will net a water gain. Of course, there's some water loss. Of course, there's you know quote unquote loss, but it really isn't. It just goes back into a healthy cycle versus um, in the horrible compacted soil, which is when you don't have enough living organisms in your soil, um, or even some you know basically earthworms help with um, providing the uh, air and the the ways for water to seep in and be a soil sponge. Um, as the, the slide mentioned that Dee Dee Pierce House is one of the uh, top experts and she's helped in Vermont in regards to remember the horrible floods that were there about a decade ago. She's helped to educate how there was too much uh, knocking down of trees and too um, and she's really helping them to bring back their healthy ecosystem to the point where California has asked for her to help amongst a bunch of other people. And they're gonna be able to reduce their wildfires, raise the water table, improve water and air quality, lengthen the green growing season, moderate the air temperatures and restore biodiversity. And as mentioned, we've all you know seen the incredible um, results from healthy soil. Um, I'm going to now show a three minute video that talks about the um, basically the, the, the proper way to see the, the water um, paradigm. And the key here is, you know, we focused on carbon is, hu is a huge thing that we need to focus on, but we have so much control over the carbon in regards to reducing the fuel um, emissions, whereas water is a lot more complicated, but it is definitely important. About climate change, we tend to think about carbon dioxide and the atmosphere warming the planet. Carbon is so central to our thinking about the climate that many other important aspects are excluded from the conversation. One of these things is water. Water is actually the dominant greenhouse gas, but its global effects are difficult to measure because it doesn't spread out evenly in the atmosphere like carbon does. Its effect on temperature also depends on the many forms it takes. When it takes the form of a haze, it has a warming effect. When it takes the form of clouds, it has a cooling effect, except for at night, in which it has a subtle warming effect. Since atmospheric water is hard to model, it tends to get ignored. But temperature is not the only important aspect of the climate here. If the climate can be warm or cold, the climate can also be wet or dry. The rampant rise of floods and droughts of our time are said to be caused by climate change, but really they are climate change. While temperature does have some effect on rainfall, floods and droughts are primarily caused by disruptions to the hydrological cycle. We tend to think of the water cycle this way. Rain falls, water evaporates, condenses into clouds, and repeats. But this is only part of the picture, since a lot more happens underground. Healthy soil is like a sponge that soaks up a lot of water. Some of it is taken up and stored by plants, and some of it percolates deep down into aquifers. This groundwater wells up and feeds springs and streams, which allows even more life to thrive. There is then much more water to evaporate from the saturated ground or to transpire through plants. This abundance of water vapor allows for more consistent rainfall. So what happens if we cut down the forest, plow the grasslands, and expose the soil? Without trees or plants to buffer the rain, the heavy downpour compacts the soil. The water can't soak down into the compacted ground, so almost all of it stays above ground and we have a flood. Almost all this water runs off, carrying loads of topsoil with it. And when the rain stops, the little water there is left evaporates very quickly, leaving the ground compact and dry. This lack of percolation depletes the groundwater over time, so it can't feed the streams, which dry up. Now there's no water in the land to feed rain clouds, and we have a drought. If a rainstorm does come, it just creates another flood and worsens the subsequent drought. Instead of consistent rainfall, we have a flood drought cycle. Fortunately, it is possible to reverse this trend. There are ways to regenerate ecosystems and restore the water cycle pretty rapidly while feeding people in the process. Making subtle changes to the land's topography can slow the flow of water, allowing more of it to soak into the ground and be used by plants. Plants with deep roots help break up the compacted soil, allowing water to percolate deeper. Everyone has a place in reversing the climate crisis. Whether you're working to protect healthy ecosystems, regenerate damaged ones, or just helping yourself or your neighbor depend a little less on industrial agriculture, you are helping the earth heal. Just a moment. OK. 
Okay, I'm gonna get back to the slides here. So a key thing to make sure to clarify is because there is no living roots, there's no living organisms, the soil, that's the main reason why it's compacted. When it rains uh, on soil, that's really not doing so well to begin with. The, the heavy rains makes it even more so compacted versus just being the primary cause. So that's, um, but definitely the, the heavy rains will make it um, even worse. Uh, so a key, a key part of the new um, water paradigm is that when we think in terms of the new water paradigm, we understand that trees and all vegetation, instead of, well, not all, instead of being users of water are instead key regulators of water in the environment. Indeed, we begin to think in terms of the role that plants are playing in the circulation of water and the transformation of solar energy. That is as temperature regulators. Now, a key distinction is it's much more effective when you have natives or native plants are much more effective with the local water cycle and the invasives act as competitors that <clears throat> throw off the, the water cycle. So that's really an important thing to um, keep in mind. So this key um, poster about composting is uh, incredible in regards to how powerful the much healthier soil is for working with the water cycle. A uh, key thing is it converts nitrogen into more stable and less mobile form and phosphorus into a less soluble, soluble form and what so it relies upon the health of the soil and all the microbiomes to do their exchange to feed versus being diluted into the water and being run off and being useless and causing damage downstream. Um, and the other key thing is compost um, is it one, of the, uh, one of the ways to help build up your soil and it helps to sell, um, the healthy soil helps to serve as a filter and a sponge. And that's, here's, here's another from just how incredible the whole water cycle is I could spend an hour on, but I won't. <laughs> so that's it for now. <laughs> okay, thanks, Carol. Yep. Uh, So that's my turn. Um, but as we're running a little late, I'm going to really run through this really fast and maybe I'll, I'll skip a few things. Um, so this is about starting seeds, um, getting the vegetable garden uh, process started. But um, I'm not sure if you would mind if uh, I skip part of this. Um, this is the, the back of the seed packet and doing the math to figure out when uh, to, to get the seed starting process going. Uh, this is the indoor seed starting process. Uh, with uh, four foot shop lights with um, daylight uh, fluorescent lights. There is a heat mat underneath it. Uh, the, the, temp uh, the seeds need to be at a certain temperature to, uh, to germinate. Um, this is a timer for the amount of uh, light to regulate the amount of light on, so 12 to 16 hours. And um, uh, the one I built is out of two by fours and plywood and it's in a unheated basement. So I scrape uh, plastic 
clear plastic sheet over the whole thing so it acts like a greenhouse and that keeps it at, at, at a great temperature. Um, this is um, uh, a soil recipe for uh, starting seeds. Um, you shouldn't really use uh, outdoor soil because um, it gets too compacted for the, for the seeds to germinate. Uh, so this, the, a choice of one of these recipes allows uh, more air um, as well as um, nutrients to help the seeds get started. Um, but the main thing I want to get to, which ties in what Carol has talked about, uh, especially last week, is uh, mycorrhizal fungi. And you can see uh, the difference with uh, plant roots that has and does not have mycorrhizal fungi is symbiotic relationship. Um, the, the fungus um, helps um, solubilize the minerals in the soil and draws it to the roots and helps um, the root interface uh, draw all the uh, nutrition into the plant as well as um, draws more moisture. And, and you can see the difference between um, below and above the surface of the soil. And um, there are, this diagram just shows you all the different reasons um, for, the, for the differences. And uh, the one on the left doesn't have the, the that symbiotic relationship and you and the drawing supposed to represent less leaves, less root development and things like that. Um, now, um, there are two different types of mycorrhizal fungi and the endomycorrhizal is the main fungus that um, aids about 85% of the uh, the green leaf plants. Uh, so most of what you're gonna grow, your fruits and vegetables will use um, this fungi. Uh, and about 10% is ectomycorrhizal. And you can see that most of them are woody plants, woody trees. Um, the thing I haven't figured out yet is uh, over time, when you have a meadow which has the end of mycorrhizal fungi um, helping the plants, and as that meadow is undisturbed and it slowly evolves into wooded areas, the fungi changes. So I'm not sure how that process occurs. Um, and then there's some plants like the, the broccolis and the beets and um, blueberries don't need any uh, fungi. And these are the, some of the companies that um, you can get uh, the fungi. Uh, the top one, BioCult Gold, it, the company is owned by um, John Kemp. He is one of the leading figures in regenerative agriculture. Um, but he sells mostly to farmers. So if you want to order from them, uh, you should probably uh, go in with several people to buy one, a bulk order. Uh, the second one is Mycoseed is um, sold through Fedco, which is a company up in Maine, and they sell both to farmers and home gardeners. So the um, scale of their products are, are a little less. And then uh, Gardens Alive sell directly, to, mostly to um, uh, home gardeners, but their uh, inoculants are mostly for um, 
keys and, and legumes. Um, so that is a very, very quick uh, uh, wrap up on, on uh, starting seeds with mycorrhizal fungi. Um, and now we're going on to Margo and hopefully she can do a quick update on what's happening with the website before we get into the um, Q&A discussion part. Okay, here I go, let me see. So. Can you see that? Yep. Okay. Um, so Grow Local for the Planet is up for the viewing uh, tread carefully. It's still delicate. <laughs> um, so that is, um, it's part of the Winchester Farmers Market Community Hub. So it's a subdomain of that. So that is why it's wfmchub.org slash grow local. But that will take you to that website. As you know, you know, the website is there to um, create a community, all of us wanting to learn and share methods of the restorative gardening. Oh, this is good. And uh, I ha it hasn't changed too much. It's changed a little bit since I last showed you a month ago, but um, it's a place to find information, resources, you know, read articles watch videos and the forum um, is where you can ask questions and share ideas. We still need to find moderators for that. So people have to volunteer to be a moderator. Also we're you know, reaching out. So our first place is um, YouTube. So we, uh, I started the Winchester Farmers Market Community Hub and within the, that, that's what you have to look up. And then from there, um, you'll find, uh, uh, sorry, <laughs> I got, I got lost. Uh, Grow Local for the Planet. And that will have, right now it has our last Zoom meeting and Linda's yard. And also it will have other videos that are made by members of this group. Um, and definitely subscribe, please. The next question I have for everybody is, so we have a website coming along and then next we're on YouTube. What are, what are your top three uh, web apps that you like to use? So we're trying to do a poll on that um, and see, what's the next step for ourselves? Um, let me stop sharing. So that's where we are now. So maybe I should write on the chat or Matilda could write, I don't know, um, our address. I did. <laughs> you did? Okay. <laughs> I put a dash in there before, but there's no dash. It's just, yeah, okay, I see it, great. So please uh, join the forum and probably in the next week or so, we'll find out who is gonna be moderating and helping to answer the questions. So I bring it back to Fred. All right, thanks, Margo. The site looks great. So now, um, Matilda, you wanna uh, yes. see what okay. we have for... Uh, questions in the, in the chat. And, um, I want to introduce first Ann Storer. Uh, Perseida had to leave for another meeting, uh, but Ann is uh, also an expert on invasive plants. And so uh, if you have any uh, questions about uh, invasives, she'd be happy to, to answer for you. Absolutely. Hi there, everybody. Um, I'm also the president of Friends of the Pond. So my specialty is also in wetlands duration. And if you live anywhere near a stream or a water or a river, 
Uh, you'll have to turn to not really you just have to follow to do work if you're in the public mode and a good setback. And I'm happy to talk about that. And the other thing I thought we could talk about is that uh, Dimitri used some methods that were, um, let me get this sound off here. making the echo. Uh, so she had, she had used methods that were more uh, for a landscaper. And a lot of things I do, I can do um, easier. Like I'll, I'll take an invasive bush like barberry and then just use my clippers and a trash bucket and take it apart piece by piece instead of having to wrap the whole thing and get it in your car. And, you know, so there's other methods of, of tackling these plants that are bit by bit. You don't have to have a big company or somebody with a lot of muscle to help you. You know, just think of breaking it down into little pieces and then taking it to the transfer station and putting it on the brush pile. And I've been doing an awful lot of that. It works really well. Thanks, Fred. So Matilda, what do you yeah, have? Yes, so, um, so I have a question about glyphosate and we've heard all the bad things it does on our health. And, but if tomorrow we stop having glyphosate uh, in our food, can we reverse the changes that we did on our health? Like the gut, for example, if we eat yogurts, it has lots of lactic bacillus, I think. <laughs> Is it reversible? Um, I can. I'm. I'm not positive, but from what I've learned, um, it it is. You can heal from it. Yes, the gut is actually really, really good at regenerating itself, and it heals um, somewhat quickly. But it's the if it's been very chronic for a long, long period of time, it's going to be harder. Um, which is why more exposure is worse than less exposure. Um, so yes, but I'm, I'm actually not entirely positive. I don't know if there's any like, like definite research on, on that, but from what I've learned, yes, it is. Thank you. So and, the, question, the question was about, can you heal the gut after glyphosate? Yes. So uh, Zach Bush, who's a real good resource for all this, he's a physician out West. He has a product ion biome used to be called restore and uh he claims that it is the sort of ancient soil connections that can make a difference it's worth looking into okay yeah i would just add i guess that you have to do a very there's you would do a gut healing protocol um you would kind of walk through the the four steps um healing the gut you'd have to be intentional about it take right supplements gut healing um l-glutamine is really important for healing the gut zinc is very important um that kind of thing so you have to be active about it maybe okay. <laughs> thank you um for the, and it's still on the glyphosate uh subject Ivan asked the question is there a quick test if your produce that you buy has glyphosate? Can you find out if it has glyphosate in your produce? I'm not quick sure. Is, like, could there be a home test or no? I don't know. I answered in the chat, um, not as a particular test that you can put on the product, but there are a couple of different ways for the um, uh, fruits and vegetables. You can go to ewg.org and they have a, a new updated Clean 15 and Dirty Dozen. So the Clean 15 are the things least likely to have pesticides if you don't get them organic, and the idea is to help you save money if that's an issue. The um, Dirty Dozen are the ones with the most. Uh, I had a patient earlier today who said, you're gonna be so proud of me. I started eating strawberries at breakfast, and I just broke my heart. Strawberries on the top. Ah, it's like one of the top one, right? It is a, <laughs> right? It's a morsel of toxins. And I said, I just, it, it killed me because she's like 17, so motivated. And I sort of said, so can you tell me more about your strawberries? And she said, oh, don't worry, they're organic. And I was like, because she's trying so hard. But um, so the, the, you know, some of the strawberries are maybe the top of the list. Also apples are one of the ones that people, 
think, you know, an apple a day keeps the doctor away. That's kind of been inverted. Um, apples, in order to keep the different species, somebody else will know more about this, they, they lose some of their own protection and they have to have more pesticides. So that's another one. Don't eat an unorganic. Don't give the teacher an unorganic apple, please. Um, and then, so that's fruits and vegetables. Um, on the uh, general crop, um, you know, wheat isn't because it's GMO. Wheat is because it's used as a desiccant to dry it out and get two crops in. So people say, oh, the wheat's not GMO. Wheat's, you know, one of the real problems. Corn and soy are also confused in all of our modern products. So don't eat processed food. You know, it's not a good idea anyway. Mm -hmm. um, but GMO is GMO in order to soak plants in glyphosate and then they are protected the, the plant itself, but the weeds are not protected and we're not protected. And then um, I think the third thing is just, you know, eat organic whenever you can, if you can. Uh, but I don't have a test on a plant. That's very, very organic. <laughs> and that's way. <laughs> right, but even. Choose. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I mean, you could get organic processed food and I'm not recommending that either. I mean, there's a lot of, I mean, I think, I think Skittles are organic. Okay. You know, things like that, I couldn't promise you, but there are things like that that, that doesn't mean eat it just because it's organic. And then organic is complicated. There's real organic and, you know, that's another topic for another day. Uh, Amanda asked uh, about alternative to glyphosate. So she mentioned triclopyr 4, garland 4, and she's wondering if those are safer than glyphosate or if there is anything uh, that we can use as an alternative if it's not triclopyr 4 or gallon 4. Uh, crickets. <laughs> uh, I have never heard of those two, uh, triclopyr and gallon four. Um, uh, no, uh, no comment. I, I can add to that, to the question, which came up specifically because I'm dealing with a lot of um, tree of heaven on my property. And um, the University of Pennsylvania recommended those as um, to like, hack and squirt, take rid of those. I don't know, maybe Anne, if you have any experience with that, if you want to speak to it. Well, please repeat the question again. What was your question? So about, um, so for, for Tree of Heaven, which are like, you know, fairly mature, like maybe about, you know, six inches around or something. Um, and too tall to slowly pick apart, <laughs> I suggest. Um, would you, what would you recommend if you were gonna try to hack and squirt to sort of, to kill the tree and then call in someone to remove it so that you don't get the runners from the shoots, like from the roots? Right, I would probably, you know, bit by bit take the tree down till you have a stump. And then the question you're asking is, do you have somebody pull out that stump for you so you don't have to poison it? You, you, you can't you can't do that with those because then they'll send out runners right it's a fairly right. well-established grove right so yeah mm. so you've got to keep at it that's mm. what it's all about you give one by one how big is it how big an area uh i mean there's a few a few different patches um maybe one is like 12 by two feet. And then there's one that I'm, I mean, the smaller ones that are narrow, we're, we're just digging out, and, you know, taking up as much as we can and going to try to get it, them down as low as we can. So right. that the won't have a lot of energy, but there's some that are, you know, about six or seven inches around the diameter and, you know, 40 feet high. So, I mean, they're, they're mm -hmm. very sturdy. They're very uh, robust that have learned to live in really bad habitat. You get a good habitat, they love it, right? Yeah. So, hmm. Are you using a chemical on it or glyphosate or Roundup? So, so far, I have not. And, and it's, I've been doing a bunch of research on it. And I know in like woodlands where they're trying to remove them, 
they'll do the, the hack and squirt method with the other pesticides that I mentioned, the Garlon 4 um, is the easier one to pronounce. Um, and, you know, and this is something I've seen, you know, pe people who I'm assuming are caring about what they're doing, but basically, I mean, they're, they're, you know, so the hack and squirt is where you just kind of cut in so that you're, so that the, you know, it's being drunk down into the roots, but you can do it very surgically. Um, and then, and then you wait kind of for the tree to die and then take it down because if you just cut it off, it wants to live and it will just sucker like. But it fights you. Fight. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's like doing that in the springtime. You're fighting their natural tendency to grow. It's really great to do it in, in the fall. Mm -hmm. Dying anyways. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I, t I, the word is persistence. Okay. Hang out there. Yeah. I would be marking. Yeah. I'd be looking at each one and marking them trying to map where they are. Mm -hmm. Agnum. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hey, Anne. Yeah. I was just wondering about that. Is, is it too much work to try to put a barrier, a perimeter barrier in the ground to prevent them from uh, spreading? Well, that's an interesting question. I know with Japanese knotweed, uh, Arlington Great Meadows has been trying a lot of different ways to eradicate that. And they were looking at smothering and cutting and pulling and, and, and you know, putting in a barrier. But um, I don't know. That's a good question. You know, and so what uh, Demeter was saying is, you know, you starve, starve it from sun, right? And uh, but there are some plants that really go underground and you never really can starve them. They're just so incredibly robust. And they Part of the reason what Demeter, Demetra didn't mention was they start sooner. Like Norway maples come out so soon and they're the first tree to leaf out. So if you see the leaves, you'll know that's in Norway and they're the last one to um, lose their leaves. So they have, this, they have an edge because of the longer growing season. And then they put off a chemical underground that mm. scares the other plants away. Do you know what that's called? There are a few different plant, a lot of plants that do that. So that's why it's first you have to stay with it. You can't say I'm going to do it once one season and then think it's gone, right? That's that's the problem. What most people do is they go in once, they do a big effort, and they come back and it's like, oh, I've got more. <laughs> they keep growing. Thank you. Um, I was looking um, at the compost question. Does anybody have um, know about what the station uses. I used it years ago and it was not clean. But I've heard from friends that it's really clean now. I just wonder if anybody has used their compost. There was a question about compost from right. they want to know can you trust it? Are there are there invasive plant seeds? So I think it's about how it, right so I haven't had a tough courage because I had such a bad lesson from using it before. And uh, but I, I've heard it's much better now. And so maybe we should we could talk to uh, the guys there and find out how they do it. That would be an interesting thing to know. I, I think Perseda is the one that's really kept in touch with that. Yep, that would be right. Because if you could use it, if it's in good shape, it's a great resource, you know. Yeah, yeah I think I think she said it is in good shape now, but she's my source too. Yeah. So do people know what invasives they have on their property? Um, have, do they have a problem? Are you trying to battle them, things? Linda, you seem to have a few of the real key ones there. <laughs> I've just been collecting them for the purpose of grow local for the planet. I know, I also, I also been, yeah, try to say, I think I'm gonna try to get every invasive from Massachusetts on my yard. Yeah, I'm feeling very proud. So in a few weeks, um, garlic mustard starts. Is that on people's radar screens? That's a really um, another plant that it's a beautiful little flower. It grows about you know 18 inches high. It's a two season, so it comes up as a as a rosette, and then um, the next year it comes up as the flower. And uh, the town of Lexington has a competition on how many pounds of it you can pick up. So it's really easy to pull it, and um, but you'll see it on our roadsides. In fact, the, the transfer station has a terrible infestation of it. You'll see it going in down to the smart area there. 
it's either side. So if you don't know what it looks like, but you really want to tackle that one and, and um, it's easy to do it. And it's the month of May. You need to do it before it sets its seeds. But hope has anybody else tried to work on garlic mustard? Nope. I'll go out and I help um, uh, some of the work crews in uh, Lexington and we pull in May, you know, you spend a couple hours pulling acres and acres of garlic mustard. Yeah, maybe we could feature that in our May. Uh, Good. Yep. And uh, Boop Boutwell does a, a little YouTube for Friends of the Fells, and he has garlic mustard on his. Yep. He's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> the other one that I've been working on is buckthorn. Is that that's very common here? You'll probably see it. Uh, I think we could do a quick one on that because everybody has it, and um, it's really running rampant across the whole U.S and taking over and it's very characteristic and you can tell by its bark. It's got a nice, has a little pattern on the bark. And um, they make a dabber called the buckthorn dabber. So if you are, if you're able to, if you're interested in doing very spot chemical treatment, you can buy the buckthorn blaster and it, it's a device that you um, fill it. And it has like in a movie theater with a felt top, you know, if you're stamping your hand. So it's very safe to use it instead of using a paintbrush, which I, I would be really worried about using an open can, you know, but it really can help you target those inch and very small uh, root systems and stems. Hi, Anne, can I jump in with a question? Hey, nice to see you. <laughs> you too. Sorry, I missed a chunk of this meeting because of another historic meeting, but um, I was wondering if anyone had mentioned working with some of the youth to like when I was a, a high school student, it was part of our extra credit that we would go out and tackle invasive species. And I was wondering if anyone had mentioned um, possibly starting a service club project or something with the, the, the kids at Lynch. I know when I walk, I see the, the mustard plant you were talking about. And so I was wondering if that was um, something that this group would be interested in guiding. I'm happy to do the legwork. Right, it usually takes an interested parent in that school. So I know I did that a lot with my adventure scouts and we would do all sorts of service projects. I think I kind of got the impression they fell out of favor for doing more, um, you know, academic or computers. You know, I, so I think it goes in waves, but uh, the scouts, the boy scouts do, still do a lot of good um, work in the, in the um, out, you know, in the field and stuff. What I found is that sometimes it's really hard work and you get young kids and then you've got, is there poison ivy there? Do they have gloves? Who's supervising? Are they running around? Are there shop? You know, some of the, Demetra is right. Those that uh, bar yeah. is incredibly sharp. If you ever gotten through your glove. So I actually wear mittens. I wear big leather mittens when I'm doing multi-four rows or, and it works great. You know, you don't really need fingers, you just need clippers. And uh, so I don't, cause you really, you get stabbed, it's painful. And so that's the problem with using kids. You have to know where you're going. And I think a lot of um, picking up trash has just kind of been like, well, you know, we're doing back really well in Winchester actually with a lot of trash. We used to see a lot more, but now on average on a river day is uh, May 1st. That's the day the conservation folks go out. We try to get people in the town to help. You know, it could be your school. It could be the town center. We get people to go out. And it's not so much about the trash, but it's helping us work on the invasives and cutting them back. And, we, and any, or it's like the Friends of the Public Library do it around there. So different organizations will all come together. And then the DPW picks up all the brush, which is a real great thing. So it's, uh, you just have to cut it, leave it on the side of the road. Elaine, the Conservation Commissioner, she puts a sign up and then they'll go by and pick it up. So if you have a, an organization that you work with or, um, an area of town you'd like to improve, that's a great day to do it. So that's coming up. But that's what we found is that there's not as much trash and it's hard to get little kids if they're under middle school age to uh, really focus and do the work. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. I was thinking more of the high school kids because um, yeah. they do the service learning. Right. Aspect. And I was wondering if we couldn't right. them. No, we wanted I to do a stu we wanted to try, Lexington, do you know the Lexington, uh, stewards is a group of 100 people or so that they manage 50 miles of trails and 
do the invasives. And we've tried to talk about that here in town of how can we help the mill pond and the judgment pond and the areas are just getting overwhelmed with bittersweet, you know, to get a volunteer group out to help us manage them. Um, so we'd love to have that. And high school kids are great, you know, got the, the muscle and the, the agility, right? Yeah, so if you got interested in doing high school stuff, I'd be happy to coordinate with that as well. I've got connections at Lynch, and I think that um, you know a well-designed plan could happen with kids. They need. I think it's also perfect when we're coming off this, well, hopeful thinking, coming off this pandemic because it's an outdoor activity, and it's uh, there's a lot to learn on the theme of uh, invasives. I'll just add that in the work I've done, I think the humans are the most invasive species of all. So, for what it's worth. Very well said, Linda. And actually, I just posted um, Earth Day this year. It, the theme is Restore Our Earth. So, I mean, I, I help clean up garbage all the time. And I kind of like the focus to maybe be a little bit more imaginative than just cleaning up trash. So I think absolutely the invasive species could be, that could be an intro day to the, to the concept. Nice idea. Our next uh, episode is going to be on Earth Day. What day is it? Uh, the 27th. The 27th. Yeah. The 22nd. And, and actually, I'm trying to figure out which some groups do events on the Saturday. So it's I think it's usually the, the like, like if it's Thursday, it's going to be the 24th, most likely, is where um, communities will, will have events. I think that's why some have picked May 1st, right? Is that right afterwards? Is May, that Saturday, right? Um, so I think the Friends of Library wanted to do it on, and they picked, so Conservation is now doing it on May 1st, uh, that Saturday, I'll take my calendar out. So um, I wanted to address something uh, Ivan asked, I answered in, in the chat. Um, he was asking about the standards for organics, how reliable they are. And um, so uh, they've actually been very diluted. Once industrial agriculture got into the picture and they used their lobbying power, their money, um, it, it really loosened up the, the regulations so much so that um, uh, in 2017, a new movement was started by a lot of the old time organic farmers. Uh, it's called the uh, Real Organic Project. And uh, they basically trying to reestablish the standards and to um, make sure that organics is connected with uh, soil quality, um, healthy soils, uh, because um, they're, one of their big arguments are that the Real Organic Project is, is that hydroponic um, is listed as organic, um, but it's to, to them, it's uh, just a different version of or, in, industrial farming. Um, it, the medium is in water and um, all the nutrients are basically injected into their system. Um, so uh, it's, it's been quite a battle. And it's like, it's like living off of TPN, you know, instead of using the gut to eat food, it's like getting it through your veins. It should yeah. be, it, it's just so, um, I don't know. Uh, ridiculous of us to think that we could itemize the list of the nutrients that would be needed for something as complicated as the body or the microbiome of the soil and that we could know what is needed and we could replace it intentionally. We say that was one of my biggest realizations when I uh, dove into studying the re regenerative is it's like, wait a minute, I thought the way they described regenerative is like, I thought that was organic and it's basically in a sense, the best of the best practices of organic. In fact, Rodale and a couple of other groups have come up with the regenerative organic 
certification because there's also a start where some regenerative are starting to be too industrialized or too like greenwashing. Uh, I mean, it's good they're, they're stepping in the right direction, but and it's one of those key things where if you see a regenerative organic certification, you're all set. But if you don't see it, it still might be because it's just so new and it costs a fair amount and there's a process. So um, an, another approach that we're going to be involved with, uh, we bought um, this hand meter, laser meter that you attach uh, through an app to your phone um, that you are able to scan produce, whether it's on the, on the plant, on the tree, on the vine, or in the grocery store or at the farmer's market. And it will till, tell you the nutrient levels of that produce. So, um, and what they think they're gonna find is that it's the quality of the soil that the, the food is grown in will determine the nutrient quality. Um, the food can be grown organically, but if the soil quality isn't that great, the, the nutritional value will still not be as good as something grown in, in really healthy soils. You mentioned, Fred, uh, like the, the fungus in your talk. And uh, one Sometimes the question was, you know, because this is really important for soil quality, and uh, you mentioned that we could bury this fungus, and uh, how do we grow the, this fungus? Do we grow it with the plants? Like Ivan put it. Well, um, there's different. So uh, you can buy the, the product. I had listed a, a few sources for it, and it comes in a in a powder form. And, and so you just add a, a little bit when you plant the seed. Uh, there are also methods of creating compost where you inoculate the compost so that the compost itself has the fungus in it. And so you just add the compost. Okay. And so Linda had an interesting question is that if uh, you have a plant that is helpful, uh, that grows well with a fungus, but you want to get rid of it, shall we save the root because it has the, the fungus? Yeah, so th that's what I've been learning about um, uh, uh, the different cycle. Like when you harvest the plant in the fall, you cut, you cut it at the base and you leave the root in the ground. So even though the, the plant is dead, the root system is still feeding the fung the, the microbiome that's in the soil. So, and then in the spring, you add, um, you can plant new plants in it and, and the bacteria and the fungus will still be in the soil. I saw that for even as you're um, uh, taking out anything that isn't where the root isn't the vegetable itself, that you can just leave the roots. And it's part of the no-till no or low-till, which is astonishing to me. And, and- um, That's great, right? And, and that's the whole concept of, of the cover crops too, is that you may, before you harvest um, your fall plants, you, you uh, seed your uh, soil with the fall cover crops, clovers and uh, winter riser, uh, um, things like that. And so there'll be a continual root system in the soil. And, so that and, leaves, uh, yeah, you, and you can do that in the spring too. Yeah. So Anne, I have a question directly for you. You saw forsythia in my yard today. Forsythia is on the list, on Fred's list for something that maybe has some of the mycorrhizal fungi. Oh. Do I cut the forsythia top off and leave the 
soil underneath to help the other things we'll be planting? Ah, good question, huh? That, needs, on a, it. that needs a biologist teacher like Prosetta to answer you that, that question. She's in, so, up. she's on the case. We'll yeah, ask her directly. So, yeah, that's an interesting question. What do you think, Fred? Um, if you want to, you know, do, so that root, you haven't killed that root. When you, Prosythia comes back stronger if you don't get rid of it completely or dab that, the, the stem, right? That little piece of the stem. And what it does, it arches over, right? And that arch goes over and that grows a new one. That's how it expands so fast. Uh, so, but it also, you can trim Forsythia and it comes back beautifully the next year. So if you just want to cut it back right after it flowers, it will grow enough and become a bush. And then the next year you'll have flowers again. You just keep cutting it every year. That's one way to control it. Hmm. If you decided you wanted to leave it, right? Well, I don't know yet. Yeah. I make decisions like that during these meetings. Not I before. I know. So it'd be interesting to see what the plant list that uh, Demeter, Demetra has for you. Yeah. What type of plant she's proposing. Yeah. Because forsythia is really, to me, it's a field plant. It needs a lot of room to be successful. And you really have a contained area. And it's not really an edge. For, to be an edge plant, it needs to be much bigger, right? It needs to be like three feet wide to be effective and colorful. You just have kind of stalks coming up, right? Yeah, so it's really not worth. So now your question, is if you yank it all up, and that's the same thing. It's the same thing with the bittersweet and the uh, multiflora rose she has there. That's 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 the same question for the uh, fungi for all of them. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah, because they all have. Yeah. Okay. So um, we're past eight thirty. Um, we just want to let you know first of all that our next session is is. April 22nd, uh, Earth Day. And uh, we have some of an outline for, for, uh, for then. One thing, um, Demetra is gonna show us how to properly um, plant trees. And um, we're also gonna start on Linda's um, raised beds. Um, we'll see. Uh, there is a um, European way of building raised beds called Kugel, and uh, it includes um, using logs buried in the soil so that there is long term nutrients um, recycling in the soil. So, we're going to try that in the raised beds containers. And uh, we'll figure out what else is going to be happening uh, in her yard that we can uh, uh, deal with. You probably have, probably some of those invasives will be gone by then too. This is the time to do it. Yeah. Actually, uh, actually um, some of Demetra's crews coming in tomorrow morning yeah. and starting on it. Now, have you started like a, a concept plan yet? So you can kind of look at your options. Do you know where you're putting your beds? Yes, yeah. Um, Demetra did a, a, a set of drawings. Was it for the first okay. one? I, yeah, uh, I it's, think. it's been elaborated and we'll offer it um, the next time. It's, it's quite, um, quite a change, but quite magnificent. Now, are you also doing the side of the house, Linda, or are you just doing the backyard? Part two, some other time, will be the rest. So uh, we are also going to be saying goodbye to Matilda. She is moving out to Colorado in a, a little over a month. And um, it's, it's, she showed up in the first episode and offered to help. And she just jumped right in and helped Margo with the website. And uh, she's been a huge help. And uh, I think she learned a couple of things. Uh, yeah. so, a couple. <laughs> Where about so, are you moving? Where, where town are you moving to? Uh, in May. What, what town? Sure. Where are you going? Uh, Colorado, Denver. Oh, Denver. Okay, my daughter lives there. Yeah, very uh, nice. My sister-in-law lives there, and my parents-in-law are moving there, so it's like COVID oh, makes us want to go back together. <laughs> Lovely. So, so it's an invitation 
Um, so just like Sarah joined us today and, and joined us today, it's like if, if you guys, anybody else wants to jump in on the conversation um, in between episodes, you're, you're all welcome. Well, Fred has done a really nice job. The video is very impressive and the work you're doing at Linda's house and the website is fantastic. What an incredible asset that is. Yeah, we have a lot of very talented people working here. Sure. Yep. And Shukan did, he, if he did the filming, it was really clear. You could hear well, it. Margo did, a, uh, Margo was a lead camera person. Okay, Margo, nice job. Oh, thanks. The, the other question I have before everyone leaves is, is moderating the forum. So I created the forum, but now we need people to answer. So those, those are some of our experts. I guess we'll uh, email each other following this meeting and talk about it. But if people want to volunteer, please tell Fred or just uh, if you would you like to volunteer, maybe we could do it. I don't know, once a week, someone can do it, or I don't know. So how, so do you need a special password to be a, a moderator or? Yeah, know? I would have to set you oh, up. Okay. But if I have enough people, I mean, if just tell me and I'll uh, uh, set you up to be a moderator. And you can also uh, write an article or write about something or photograph something. We'll put that up too. Everyone is a contributor. Everyone is a creator. Yeah, what's going on in your yard? What's going on where? What in your yards. In yeah. our, everybody's yard, you mean, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Yep. So the, that's part of where the social um, media might help if we use Instagram or we use the YouTube or whatever we do, whatever is cool, you know, people are comfortable with. Or we could just post in the website, whichever. We'll see how it flows. I uh, I put in the chat that Priscilla has some seeds that are she bought in bulk and she has more than enough. So if anybody has any, contact her. I'm going to try to grab some, but I think there's really plenty, and she wasn't here to be able to say that. What kind of seeds? I don't know. Uh, they're perennials, uh, wildflower. Per okay. Cool. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. There's Lily. Lily, one. Hey, Lily. Hi. Hi. How are you doing? I was thinking about you because I did sort of a logo, but I'm not that happy with it. <laughs> of course, you have to volunteer. <laughs> Would you be interested? You can volunteer me, yeah. Yeah, Margo for us. Mar Margo, the more help Margo has, the happier she is. She likes to collaborate. With yeah, I am. People. I want to. I want to have a community of creators. Yeah. If you're interested, tell, you know, job. email me, okay? Because <laughs> I'm not happy with mine. All right. Okay. okay. Bye. Bye. Good to see Take you. Care. Yeah.